Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature and sing. Heaven and nature and sing. Heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is bound, far as the curse far is bound, as the curse is bound. far as, far as the curse is bound. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love Glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. Hail the heavenborn Prince of Peace, Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and light to all He brings, Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Heart the herald angels sing. Glory to the Oh, 
come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be our glory again. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Uh, welcome to the online service of Valley Christian. We are so grateful that you are here this morning viewing this. And if you've been with us all year long, I want to say thank you for sticking it out. We really, really appreciate you viewing us each week. And this is a special service because it is our Christmas service. It's not very often that Christmas falls on an actual Sunday. So again, if you're watching this, Merry Christmas, and we're super glad that you've joined us today. And today we are going to be doing a Christmas-themed service, uh, and you'll understand what I mean in a little bit. Now, I want to start with a prayer before we get started so that we can really get our hearts and minds in the place to really accept and to hear what God has to show us today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings for your many, many blessings, for making it to another Christmas, Father, uh, really just not deserving the blessings that you give us, not deserving the gifts that you give us, but we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, the Father of lights, who does not shift like the shadows, but God, you remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're grateful. We're grateful for Jesus, grateful for his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and grateful for what he means to us in our lives. Father, we pray that you be with those that may be alone right now at Christmas, may be hurting, may be suffering, may be going through tough times, that you bring them comfort. Father, we are grateful, Lord, because we know that you have the perfect plan to see as many people saved as possible. And we pray, Father, that your will be done in a great way, that your plan be executed, and that we might be part of that plan, Father, that we may be saved, and we may help others, God, to know Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been told a story or told something and a person says, well, don't, don't take it personally? You know, the reason why they say that is because we probably will take it personally because what is about to be said might not, might not be very nice, might not be very um, complimentary to us. But I want you to take this personal. I want you to take this personal with the things that we're going to be talking about this morning. Because too often, when we think about Christmas, when we think about the holidays, uh, sometimes we can get caught up in the commercialism of it. We can get caught up in what I'm going to get or what I'm going to give. And we forget that the reason for all of this is Jesus Christ and him crucified and his birth, and his death, and his resurrection, all these things, Jesus is the reason for this season of Christmas. And really, it's not just this season, it's Jesus is the reason for our lives, if we take him personally. And so as we go through the sermon today, it is a sermunion, and what that means is it is going to prepare our hearts for taking the Lord's Supper together. And Obviously, we know that when we take the Lord's Supper, it is the bread that represents his body broken for us, the juice that represents his blood spilled for us. We celebrate communion not just once a year, but every week to remind us of how grateful we should be for all that Jesus has done for us, all that Jesus 
means to us. Again, taking it personally. So take it personal this morning, the well wishes of Christmas, and take it personally, the things that we're going to talk about today. And I want to remind us before we get into the, the sermon that on New Year's next week at 3.30 at Green Valley United Methodist, we are going to be having a congregational service. And we want to invite you, if you are at all able to come, please join us for that service. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be not launching our new theme. We're going to have special items and just a, a, a real special time. So I pray that you can join us. And so, like I said, it is time to take what is going to be said this morning personal because it's going to be a lot of great stuff. And so I want you to look at these films. Now, these films are superhero films from Marvel, from DC, and some of them are cartoons and, and some of them are live action. But what they have in common is they deal with the supernatural, if you will, the superhuman. They use special effects to wow us and to dazzle us and to create worlds that are beyond our imaginations, but obviously the imagination of somebody. And I believe that these things can cause us to grow desensitized or even numb to real life supernatural activity, real life superhuman, super uh, natural, miraculous, if you will, miraculous things. We, we watch these movies and granted, if you're like me, it's a little bit of an overload, right? Superhero movie overload. And that's fully saturated on these things because it's on every streaming net network, everything that we can, uh, that has a screen has something to do with. It seems like a, a superhero movie, but bottom line is it can cause us to grow numb to real life miracles real life supernatural activity that really is attributed to God. And it's a quite a possibility that we have become bored. We, we have become just immune to being amazed by God, being amazed by what he has done. You know, when we read the story of Christmas, when we read the story of Jesus's birth, it is filled with miracles. It's filled with supernatural events. It's filled with things that to a, a to generations before CGI, generations before all these superhero comics and all these things, it amazed. It caused them to be in awe, the workings of God. And when I say take it personal, I want you, I want you to ask yourself the question, are you still amazed by God? Are you still in awe of what he has done and what he is doing in this world? When we think about the story of the birth of Jesus, we, we can't forget the virgin birth. We can't forget the angels appearing to several different people. We can't, uh, we can't neglect the mere fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who existed in heaven with God the Father and God the Spirit, that he robed himself in flesh and became just like us. He could become hungry and thirsty, hot or cold. He became just like us. And as the scripture said, he was tempted in every way, just like us, and yet was without sin. And who can forget, and we often do, prophecy. The fulfillment of prophecy, the, the probability of Jesus fulfilling the dozens of prophecies is miraculous, is supernatural. And so I wanted to focus in on the birth of Jesus. Obviously, it's Christmas, and so we're going to talk a, li a little bit about uh, or a lot about the birth of Jesus. So in Luke chapter one, starting in verse 26, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son 
and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You know, when we read this, we have probably heard this story so many times, we fail to be amazed at the magnitude of what is going on here. Number one, you have an angel sent by God to a small town, a small remote town. And Luke, who is writing this, he said he set out to kind of lay out the, the, the happenings and what went on uh, in, in Jesus's life. And what we see here is the tradition or the stories that have been passed down. And these are the things that the early church hung their faith upon. Not because they had seen it before, not because they had heard it before, but because it was something brand new. It was something that they knew only God could achieve. A virgin birth, angels visiting people, uh, you see God, the, the Son of God robing himself in flesh, God making his home among his people. I mean, these are things that, again, fiction is made out of, but this is very much true. But not only that, the people can go back to Old Testament scriptures and see how in that, in that one scene or that one happening of Jesus's birth, that there could be many prophecies that they would be familiar with, many passages of scripture that they could be familiar with, that it brings to mind that Jesus's birth fulfilled. And I want to read to you a, a, an article or a part of an article from What Are the Odds Surrounding Jesus Christ? And this was an article from ChristianAnswers.net. It says, a number of years ago, Peter W. Stoner and Robert C. Newman wrote a book entitled Science Speaks. The book was based on the science of probability and vouched, and vouched for by the American Scientific Affiliation. It, I'm sorry. The book was based on the science of probability and vouched for by the American Scientific Affiliation. It set out the odds of any one man in all of history fulfilling even only eight of the 60 major prophecies and 270 ramifications fulfilled by the life of Christ. The probability, get this, that Jesus of Nazareth could have fulfilled even eight such prophecies would be one in 10 to the 17th power. That's one with 17 zeros following it. Stoner claims that the many... That many silver dollars would be enough to cover the face of the entire state of Texas two feet deep. Now, I've been to Texas. I've driven for days to get across Texas. Texas is a very big state. Who in his right mind would suppose that a blindfolded man headed out of Dallas by foot in any direction would be able to, on his first attempt, to pick up one specifically marked silver dollar out of one with 17 zeros following it. I'm not sure the, the quintillion, nonillion, I'm not sure, but that many quarters, how many people would be able to, on their first shot, walking any direction, be able to pick up that silver dollar? And yet that, that's what Jesus did, but he not only fulfilled eight prophecies, he fulfilled dozens, up to 60 prophecies. And, and as it says, 270 ramifications, I, I, I submit to you that that is what movies, that is what should inspire our faith. 
That mere fact should be the thing that causes us to be in awe. We'll spend two, three hours watching a movie that takes place in front of a green screen and be amazed at what we see. And yet we sit hour after hour after hour in church. And sometimes we're not even amazed at the story of the birth of Jesus. What I want to do is try to create some of that awe by looking at different prophecies in the Bible that just a few, we're not even going to cover eight. That's a Christmas miracle. But we're just going to cover a few of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled just by being born. Number one, it says one of the prophecies is that Christ would be filled with power, peace, and the spirit from birth. In Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, it says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. Again, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse one, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness the prisoners. Now, Isaiah wrote around the 700s BC, okay, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And yet Luke chapter four, verse 18, Jesus says, The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. And if we know anything about the ministry of Jesus, he did all those things. He fulfilled that prophecy to a T. Another prophecy is that Christ would be born of a virgin. In Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Its fulfillment is seen in Matthew chapter one, verse 23, and also what we just read in in Luke. Mary received the same prophecy when the angel Gabriel visited her, and we see this fulfilled clearly through scripture when it says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which, which means God with us. We see that in Matthew and in Luke, we capture the birth of Jesus through Mary, who was a virgin, pledged to be married to Joseph, but was a virgin, did not know what it meant to be with, be with a man. And so again, people will dispute, will dispute many things, but how can you dispute that miracle and that prophecy? It says a star would point the way towards Christ. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob and a scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. And so we see here in Numbers, written hundreds of years before Isaiah and hundreds even more before Jesus, we see this fulfilled because We know the Magi followed the star. In Matthew chapter two, verse one and two, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the sun, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. See, even people that weren't directly Jews or, or Hebrew, they came to follow Jesus or came to worship Jesus. And that actually fulfills another prophecy. I don't have it in front of me, but fulfills another prophecy about the fact that all nations will be blessed through Abraham's seed, but that people will worship this king that was born. And it goes on when we talk about another prophecy about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. In Micah, Chapter five, verse two, written pretty close to when Isaiah was written. The Lord says, Bethlehem, you might not be an important town in the nation of Judah, but out of you will come a ruler over Israel for me. His family line goes back to the early years of your nation. It goes all the way back to the days of long ago. 
And in Matthew chapter two, verse 10, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem because they had come to worship him and found him in Bethlehem where he was born. And we know the story that they had to go back to the original uh, city where Joseph was from, that was Bethlehem. And we know the whole story about there's no room in the inn and he was born in a manger where that all took place in Bethlehem where Jesus was born as a prophecy or as Micah had prophesied. Another more uh, obscure and maybe not as popular prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, it reads, a voice is heard in Rama, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. In Matthew 2, verse 16, we know that Herod had basically given an edict to kill every child to and under in that region where he believed Jesus to be. And I know in our minds, we're thinking thousands of babies, but you got to remember these were small towns. They weren't large towns. And how many two-year-olds were there? Maybe, maybe a dozen, maybe less, maybe a little bit more. But still, the fact that one child, Herod would give the edict to kill one child, would cause there to be mourning. But in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, it says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. And we read Jeremiah 31, verse 15, about the mourning in Rachel refusing to be comforted. Again, that's a sad prophecy, but one that was fulfilled. How could Herod know that he was fulfilling a prophecy that would made that was made hundreds of years earlier? He was just basically serving himself and yet still fulfilling the prophecy of God. And lastly, we see... Jesus would be called to escape Egypt or be called out of Egypt. In Hosea chapter 11, verse one, it says, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt, I called my son. Well, we see the fulfillment in Matthew chapter two, verse 13, because it says an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And it was out of Egypt that Jesus, or that Joseph and the family were called back to settle in Nazareth. So these are just four or five prophecies that we covered of the 60 or more that predicted what Jesus would do or how Jesus would be or where he would be born. And the thing that blows me away, the thing that causes me to give to, to give pause is how could someone hundreds of years in the past predict where someone was going to be born, when someone was going to be born, how someone was going to be born, what the ramifications were going to be when this child was born. And yet that's exactly what happened. And that's not including all the prophecies about how Jesus would die, how Jesus would live, all the things that he would do. Guys, are you amazed? Are you amazed at the God that we serve? The Messiah that has saved us? I want you to take it personal. I want you to take it personally because it really matters how we live, how, how we're going to live our lives as a result of us taking it personally. I think too many people keep these things at bay. And in doing so, they keep at bay the power of God in our lives. As we go into communion, I want to read a passage of some other people or some people in particular, a couple of people that took it personally, where Jesus's birth meant something to them personally. In Luke chapter two, verse 22, it says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated for the Lord and to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon 
who was a righteous and devout, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and the sword will pierce your own soul too. And when we look at this, and it goes on to talk about our prophetess, Anna, but I, I want you to think about Simeon. I want you to think about what Jesus represented to him. God had made him a promise that he would not die before he sees the Lord's Messiah. Can you imagine what it meant for him to hold Jesus? What it meant is that God is faithful. Last week, we talked about we talked about the fact that we can have hope because the promises of God are not based on circumstances, but are based on the power of God. When we read this story of Jesus's birth, it is chock full of all of God's power, all of God's glory and all of the ways that he is faithful in the way that he moves in our lives. And we have to make sure that we don't miss it. You might say, miss it. How, how would we miss it making it personal? Simply by this. We look at Christmas as something that is either something we participate in because it's that time of year, we look at Christmas, we can get caught up in the commercialism of it all, or we can look at Christmas as a fulfilled promise to you, to me, of salvation. See, when I look at, when I look at the birth of Jesus and when I take it personally, I take it as, man, God wants me to be with him and literally moved heaven and earth so that I can know him and he could be with me and I could be with him. I take it personal because it means that I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to live how he wants me to live. Now, I'm not going to do it perfectly, but that's a whole purpose of grace. That's a whole purpose of mercy. It's to be there and it's to make up for where we lack. But that's the whole point of being in Christ. You see, Christ lived that perfect life. And when we take it personally, we are in Christ. And our lives are hidden in Christ. As we take communion on this Christmas day, it shouldn't even, it shouldn't even be more special because it's Christmas. It should be more meaningful. Because today we're sitting down and we're celebrating the mere fact or the great fact that God sent his son out of love and out of a desire to be with us, to be with you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves me. He loves people. And he wants all men to be saved. Unfortunately, all men don't want to be saved. All men don't want to come to him. But I pray that you are making it personal. I pray that you are taking it personally. This miracle that we celebrate on Christmas is really the miracle that allows us to be saved. It allows us to have this relationship with God because we know that Jesus, as we celebrate in the communion, went on to die for our sins. 
he went on to be raised to new life and we wait to be with him forever. And we celebrate these things because he came and was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He fulfilled the prophecies. So I pray that we will not look at Christmas as just a thing, but we look at Christmas as the beginning of the greatest story and the greatest miracle known to man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his birth. Thank you for the life that he lived. And thank you for his death and dying for our sins. Most importantly, thank you for his resurrection from the dead. As we take this communion, we do so in remembrance of him, in gratitude of him, in gratitude of your love. God, you are awesome and you are incredible. And I pray that our lives can reflect our gratitude for our salvation. Father, if, if there's anything hindering us from connecting with you, God, reveal it, expose it, remove it. Father, I pray that as we take this communion, we can do so in a worthy manner and in a manner recognizing the power at work in the birth of Jesus the power at work in our lives even today. We hold to your promises and therefore we have hope in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless, and we'll see you next time.